I want to do my part. I knew I wanted to do something special. When in doubt, whip it out. Tell the story. You're a storyteller. To this day, like, I know that that's my calling. Jericho Denman. Jericho Denman, who served multiple tours in Afghanistan. Former U.S. Army Ranger Jericho Denman. Join us now for more on this. Former U.S. Army Ranger Jericho Denman. I'm Jericho Denman. I was an uh, Army Ranger for 20 years. I retired four years ago, and now I work at Black Rifle Coffee as the uh, media first sergeant. I was an Army brat. My dad was a Vietnam vet, moved all over the country, all over the world. I joined the Army in 1997, went to Ranger School in nine months. I don't know, for whatever reason, I did really well. Good leader was like my thing. It made me an adaptive person. I fucking loved it. In 2004 and five, just, just slam that fast forward button, and we're doing entirely unilateral ops, all by ourselves, C2'd by us, then hit fast forward again to like 2010. Our command is running Afghanistan. So we went from being highly trained airborne light infantry unit that had a number of special skill sets to execute things in the soft community to being a bona fide standalone National Command Authority strike force that can be used anywhere in the world with a shitload of confidence that we're gonna accomplish the mission. So my combat experience spanned I say 15 deployments. All total, I did 54 months in combat. My segue into my post-Army career was in military tech advising. Action! I was originally only gonna do a couple weeks on this show called The Long Road Home. It was a limited series on Nat Geo about Solder City. And I had a pretty good amount of Solder City time under my belt, so the network found me. He's like, hey man, you wanna come down? Just do a couple weeks of pre-production. Basically doing page flips, table reads to make sure the lingo's right, and also training the cast. Did that, and then a couple weeks later, and they're like, we wanna have you back. You know, working on that set, like I didn't get it in that first, that pre-production chunk, right? Cause it was just pre-pro. But then when I came back and we were in principle, it kind of felt like home a little bit. It was like an operation, right? You had these people who do this thing, these people who do this thing. They're all synced up by this person. They work their ass off and they're good. So I was into it. We were holding them to a standard, making them do 20 good reps before we were good for them to move on. Cut. Long Run Hope was my first gig, and then on mile 22, I was one of the tech advisors. Then I did, not the biggest, but the thing I'm the most proud of was I did the outpost. Stay right there, don't fucking move. So I was like pre through post production. And in addition, the rollout, the PR for it. That was a super rewarding experience. And then I've done a couple movies that I don't want to talk about on film here, because they're stupid. <laughs> Writing for Coffee or Die and doing what I do in general, it all went back to, you know, how I met Logan in the first place and went to the Peru, to the jungle, and drank ayahuasca. Shitty, horrible night of my life. But like every hard thing that happens in your life, it shaped who I am and it made me so much happier of a person at the end of that experience. And something that was very, came through to me very clear was you're a storyteller. I saw the path, I'm like, hey, coffee or die, black rifle, free range American, here we are, writing stories, producing content, making videos about whatever the fuck we want. And I couldn't fucking say no to that. I'd made a friend, a really legit combat correspondent, war journalist named Jane Ferguson. The president announced we were gonna pull out of Afghanistan on X date, I don't remember what it was. So I immediately contact her. I'm like, hey, are you gonna be in, in Afghanistan for the total withdrawal of US forces? She's like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna be there. It's like, can I come? So we landed. I realized there's no one in charge of anything except getting people out. No one cares if you get off the plane. There were no fucking rules. It was like Lord of the Flies. The longer I stayed, the more people realized I was there. And then the messages started coming in and I was going to these gates, just plucking people. That became my focus. That was hard. Like I had to start basically triaging these requests. It's like being in a mass casualty situation and like deciding who you're gonna save and who you're not. 
At that time, you didn't understand how the Taliban was going to behave and all that. In your mind, then, in that place, you're like, oh, that guy's going to be dead in a week. That family's going to be dead. Those, that guy's kids are going to be orphans. Those girls are going to be into, like, pushed into a forced marriage at age 12, like, next week. And I can't do fuck all about it. I kind of got that, like, combat leader mindset back to where I was like, yeah, I have to do this, but it's so that this can happen. I keep remembering at this point, like, I'm here to do a story, right? I'm here to, here to cover this for Coffee or Die. But then things kind of started to shift. The vibe on the ground, or like how it was, it was like a movie. It was surreal. When I was on HKI, when I was going out to Abbey Gate, like these fucking Marines, guys and gals, these 82nd people, like they were constantly fucking working to pull these people in. All of them had this fucking amazingly positive attitude. It was humbling. Fucking thank you guys. Like, fuck you're doing like some shit work here. You know, as I was there, as I was in HKI, uh, I wrote a dispatch, was then picked up by the New York Post's care of Coffee or Die. Actually, that article may have, this sounds cheesy, but it may have saved my life. I got contacted by ABC and they were like, hey, can you get back to Doha by this time? Like, yeah, so I hopped on one of the C-17s that was boogieing back to Doha, like an hour, 30 minutes before the bomb hit. So then I'm like, fuck, I, I was just there, just with those, those fucking Marines. And like, I recognized, you know, a bunch of them. It was like a one, two, three, four, five, six punch. They were put into a situation that like absolutely was not their bag. And they had to assume all that risk to do the right thing. Um, but also whatever the fuck it takes to keep saying their names and to keep reminding people of what, what it is they did um, is important. So for me, next thing is 36, 48 hours from now, I'm going to the Ukraine, which is a spicy thing to do. I have a unique set of skills that will serve in me being able to go over there and, and tell this fucking story. See down the block, a lot of smoke. We just took a pretty significant amount of artillery or rockets, I couldn't tell. I don't know what the fuck's going on there. I've been wrong and right about so many things happening in Ukraine that I've lost track. Those big news networks that are supposedly out there to give us the truth, to help influence the decisions that we make, they're not doing it. So I wanna go do it. I wanna give people the truth. What I mean to say is I don't wanna be rich and famous. I wanna be a fucking storyteller. And this is the place where you can do that and you don't have to fucking make it for anyone except for the truth. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Taking the lead, we don't follow. We need it now, not tomorrow. Don't care what they say, not changing the pace. Working too hard to be last in the race. So much time in the day and it ain't none to waste. Working this hard. Hey world, I hope you liked that video. If you want to see more of my adventures, just go to blackriflecoffee.com backslash J-A-R-I-K-O because my parents don't know how to spell it.